So, good evening, everybody. Let me warmly welcome you to this colleague lecture on ethical orientations toward repair and climate change by Professor Alexis Shotwell. My name is Frank Adloff. I'm a sociologist at the University of Hamburg and together with Dikat Neckel, one of the directors of the Humanities Center for Advanced Studies, Futures of Sustainability. We host this event this evening together with the lecture series Out of the Dark, organized by Christina Henschel and Susanne Krasmann. Our Humanities Center, Futures of Sustainabilities, uh, the focus of this center is on various meanings and trajectory, trajectories of sustainability. And we distinguish three possible trajectories, modernization, transformation, and control, which represent very different and highly contested imaginaries of the future. The concept of sustainability is thus closely linked to the question of the future. And this in turn is linked to the question of ethics for the future, and thus to the question of responsibility. But ethical duties and ideas of responsibility are too often understood in an individual manner, for example, as an individual responsibility to be exercised through ethical consumption. This is not only too demanding and futile for the individual, it is also unsociological and ethically misleading. This topic is of huge interest to us and we are having a small workshop on these issues today and tomorrow. Therefore, we are very happy to welcome Alexis Shotwell as a distinguished expert on these questions with us today. Our today's lecture will be recorded for our YouTube channel and that is the reason why we start with a Zoom webinar. We will stop the recording right after Alexis' talk, so the following, following discussion will not be recorded. For the discussion, all participants will be given the right to turn on the video and audio and ask their questions, so to speak, personally. But let me now introduce our esteemed speaker to you. Professor Shotwell is a philosopher. She's a professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Carlton University, Ottawa, where she is cross-appointed with the Institute of Women's and Gender Studies and the Department of Philosophy. After her BA and MA studies in Canada, she received her PhD from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Alexis works in social philosophy, political theory, feminist philosophy, especially on questions of moral complicity. She's also the lead researcher for a project on the history of AIDS activism in Canada. In 2011, she published the book, Knowing Otherwise, Race, Gender and Implicit Understanding, which was published with Penn State Press. That is a very interesting book on implicit or tacit knowledge that was the, and that was the reason why we met before a few years ago and had a lively exchange on embodied and implicit forms of knowing how in difference to knowing that. I'm even more pleased that her last book now includes another overlap of interests. In 2016, Against Purity, Living Ethically in Compromised Times appeared. It appeared with the University of Minnesota Press. The book deals with, among other topics, impurity and imperfection as a basis for action in the field of environmental justice. Alexis' basic thesis is that a state of purity cannot be achieved and must ultimately remain a fiction. She writes, I quote, since, since it is not possible to avoid complicity, we do better to start from an assumption that everybody is implicated in situations we repudiate. We are compromised and we have made compromises and this will continue to be the way we craft the worlds to come, whatever they might turn out to be." Unquote. Having this in mind, we are curious to learn more about ethical orientations toward repair and climate change. We are really happy to have you with us, Alexis, and the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Frank. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I want to also thank um, everyone in both Out of the Dark and in the Humanity Center for Sustainability, for uh, infrastructural work and for this invitation, which has been um, already very wonderful for me. So I have a PowerPoint show to share. Uh, I also am going to um, post in the chat for you a link to an access copy of this talk. So I put these up just for the moment that we're all here together in case it is easier for you to um, read along with a talk. You're welcome, very welcome to do that. Um, I'll start sharing the screen and say a couple more things. So uh, I'm sad not to be there in person. Um, and some of the things that are afforded to us with being online are that it is possible to have uh, captioning. So as you'll see on the bottom of this screen, there is a approximate uh, narrative of what's happening. So if you prefer to look at the slideshow, um, you can also read a version of the words, not too bad version. Um, this slideshow has no flashing images. Um, it uh, has some images, which in general I'll describe if they're relevant. Um, I will also be reading all of the quotes that are posted here. So if you want to take this time to uh, lie down and listen to the talk or walk around, uh, you won't miss anything by not looking at the slideshow. So if you have any um, questions that come up or things that are problems, the other good thing about this format is that you can uh, put them in text and uh, one of us can help with them. Um, especially I invite you if I'm talking too fast uh, or uh, saying things in an unclear way or something happens, please let me know right away. I am uh, six hours earlier than you and I've had a fair amount of caffeine today. So if uh, I begin to speed up, that is something I want to hear and correct. So the work that I'm sharing with you today is uh, something that I'm in the process of working on for my new book. And the, this piece is the piece that is most um, centrally coming out of the Against Purity book, which Frank kindly mentioned. So you'll see a number of the places where I'm um, working with some of these questions about individualism and purism and trying to move them in a direction. For me, sharing work that is in progress is always uh, a little bit um, risky in the sense that I'm not 100% sure that the directions I'm going with this work are the right directions to go. Um, but I feel um, so delighted to be able to share with you something that I haven't finished thinking about because I really welcome whether this lands in a way that feels like it's getting traction and productive or if there are directions that you see that I should be taking. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share. Um, share this work. This I'm going to read, um, and this should take me about 40 minutes. Um, so, uh, so we'll just launch in together. So I begin with Jesuit priest, pacifist, and anti-nuclear activist Daniel Berrigan, who once gave a famously short convocation speech at a New York high school. He came on stage and said only, know where you stand and stand there. I'm interested in both parts of this instruction, the epistemic and the active. Knowing where we stand is a complex collective endeavor in which we rely on networks of other people. Standing there is an activity, a form of holding space in the present and shaping the world to come. Knowing where we stand and standing there are achievements 
in which we express our personal specific self. And they necessarily involve engaging the whole world, whether that's in collaboration or opposition. Part of the reason I come back to the intertwined injunction to know and to do involves Berrigan himself offering it. How can I think about this man, a Catholic priest who seems to have unflinchingly understood the wrongs of his church, remaining a Catholic priest in the face of fellow members of his faith using their position to harm others, or knowing that the church promulgated just war doctrines, or that it had historically been a motor for genocidal oppression through the church's role in colonization. Berrigan interests me precisely because of his implication in horrific wrongs and his formulation of what it means to respond to that implication by refusing to abandon the relationship. I think of my relationship with human caused global warming, ecosystem damage and ongoing extinction crises as similar in some way with Berrigan's relationship with Catholicism, with the difference that there is no priesthood I can renounce as regards climate change. I live in what is currently Canada. As a state, Canada relies on extractive industries and the colonial land theft that sustains them. Canada seems to be committed to doing anything and violating anything in order to continue current practices around oil, not to mention trees, uranium, nickel, and many other substances rendered as extractable resources for profit. My relationship with oil as an immigrant to Canada is complex. I believe Canada should respect the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and thus Indigenous law, live up to our commitments to address global warming and thus not build new oil pipelines, fulfill the explicit and implicit treaty agreements that founded the nation and military interventions in other nations, including within our borders, and much more. As a Canadian, I pay into an unregulated pension plan that invests heavily in oil futures, as well as tobacco advertising and migrant detention facilities on the US-Mexico border. I cannot change this investment. My taxes pay for military interventions and fund the politicians who ignore treaty relationships. I drive a car, turn on heat and lights and fly to conferences. I'm complicit in Canada's protection of resource extraction from pretty much any angle I think of, simply in virtue of the complex web of relations through which I live and breathe. I benefit differentially as a white immigrant mortgage holder from histories of and present social relations of land theft and colonial impression. So in complex situations like, if we're honest, just being alive, we make all sorts of compromises and become complicit in all sorts of things we would like to wash our hands of. So I'm implicated and maybe complicit. And there's space to think about whether those are the same or different, which we could talk about in the discussion. When people charge someone with complicity, Frequently, the result of that charge is a particular kind of immobility. So when we're charged with complicity, we might tend to turn inwards with shame or an overwhelmed feeling of how impossible it would be to extract ourselves from currently ubiquitous relations of extraction. Often, feeling complicit means that we give up on action. Indeed, frequently, the charge of complicity is meant precisely to claim that if you are implicated in something, you do not have standing to oppose that thing. This is worth investigating because if calling out complicity is meant to prompt effective ethical or political action, but instead derails precisely that action, the charge of complicity itself might produce further complicity or at least not help precisely with furthering the goal of repairing the relevant harm or wrong. So I'm interested in whether identifying complicity can produce collective solidarity, the kind of struggle that causes power to hear demands instead of individual immobilization. So I'll begin with a short section on why complicity and complexity so often evoke moral immobilization 
which I think comes down to some problems with individualism. I'll lay out my sense of when it is coherent to say we are complicit and when we should reject the language of complicity. In section two, I'm going to offer Elizabeth Minich's distinction between intensive and extensive evil and put it in conversation with Elizabeth Spellman's account of repair as a creative form of destroying brokenness. In section three, I'll outline a couple of practices of relationality that might offer moral traction for choosing which side we're on, recognizing that we are frequently complicit without our own will or intent, but resolving to act anyhow. So I observed two things about the responses that mark what I'm calling the usual view of complicity as for closing action. And the image here is of Rodin's thinker thinking. Um, first, a common response to charges of complicity is epistemic. People often say they didn't know about the relation that has been pointed out to them. And they respond by trying to know more and to educate others. Perhaps because Often, those of us who benefit from social relations of oppression learn about its harms in spaces dominated by epistemophilia, the love of knowledge, notably universities. This response makes intuitive sense. If we experience ourselves as well-intentioned, not meaning to cause harm, and feel that the main problem was that we did not know ourselves to be complicit in a, in a complicit role, responding epistemically is quite understandable. In that case, we can learn more, follow better Twitter organic intellectuals, host teach-ins, or educate others about how they too are implicated in terrible things. Excuse me. So consciousness raising is still, I believe, a politically important project. And I do not mean to disparage it here. After all, knowing where we stand requires knowing. It is epistemic. But if we take a solely epistemically focused approach to social relations of oppression and benefit, we commit to epistemic action and political inaction. So I'm calling this the know-it-all reaction. This reaction is especially immobilizing in the case of responding to climate change because the imperative that we know everything relevant before taking action has had the effect of endlessly deferring action. Climate change is complex and reparative possibilities are emergent enough that we cannot be certain of precisely how they will unfold. This makes the call for further knowledge or casting doubt on whether we know enough to respond to climate change, a very effective political demobilization strategy for people invested in inaction on climate matters. Complicity awareness can also take the form of identifying the complexity and interrelatedness of our world, highlighting the inescapable embeddedness of our being in the world. And this can freeze us in two other ways, dispersing responsibility or giving up on responsibility. The complex and big nature of the problems confronting moral agents today can make it seem that no one in particular is responsible for taking them on. As Eva Heifer Giraud argues in her book, What Comes After Entanglement, Quote, though it might be important to recognize the nuances of a given situation, this can also make it difficult to determine where culpability for particular situations really lie, let alone offer a sense of how to meet any ethical responsibilities emerging from the situation. Irreducible complexity, in other words, can prove paralyzing and disperse responsibilities in ways that undermine scope for political action. And when I first read uh, Giraud's book, I got to this part and I was very excited because there's a footnote that, um, that you know, has this sort of like, but people are working on the um, epistemic and political response to this. And I thought, great, because that's what I need because that's where I feel like I haven't found my footing yet. So I went to the end note and it was a citation for my book. And I was like, no, <laughs> I wanted you to have the answers. So we're all clearly still working on this, which this talk is trying to advance. So I really appreciate this 
um, point that when there are actions that we can take to oppose systemic racism or use less plastic or support libraries and education workers or reduce our carbon footprint, you know, itself a formulation of the petrochemical industry and so on, many of us um, can respond with a kind of moral fatigue. So there's so many things we know that we would like to do or stop doing. So many ways we're connected to the suffering of the world that we just get tired. I think this tendency is what leads to a kind of counterphobic reaction to, for example, thinking about global warming, rising seas, climate catastrophes, and the extinctions of so many non-human beings. Since I cannot solve all of these things, the reaction might go, I may as well fly as much as I like, eat as many single serving high fat yogurts as I want and so on. So I call this the give up on it reaction or the fuck it reaction. So for lots of reasons then, conservatives and liberals alike, particularly the subspecies whose main political work is trolling people on the internet are fond of this complicity line of critique for any of us who want to take action about something like climate change. This can take the form of calling hypocrisy on people who are now saying something when they didn't raise a protest in the past. It also takes the form of pointing out inconsistencies as when trolls tweeted to a friend that she could not both oppose human fueled global warming and drive her car. Or it could be arguing that if someone benefits from something, they cannot protest it as when people say it's impossible to criticize the US military and enjoy the supposed peace that it's supposedly protecting. So each of these criticisms deploys what we can call um, purity politics. Because the person expressing the desire for another world is complicit or compromised, they are supposed to give up. Conservatives and liberals alike use purity politics to try to close down action and critique, or to put it another way, to motivate particular kinds of actions and inactions. And the slide here has an image of a stained glass of a, a saint offering alms to the benighted poor and just a little diagram that on one side has know it all and on the other side has give up on it all, unified by this idea that those are both forms of purity politics. So bridging, prioritizing knowing it all and deciding to give up on it all Purity politics picks out the salient problem with how we normally engage complicity. Only an individual can aspire to be pure, to know everything that it might be important to know. Or maybe it's better to say, only the conceit of a delimited individual, sovereign in his skin, independent and unreliant on others, sufficiently potent to be able to make any needful changes in the world around him, capable of knowing in advance what the correct course of action might be and not deviating from it, capable of knowing everything relevant to any given situation, someone who does not make mistakes, only such an individual would be invulnerable to charges of complicity. No such individual exists. All of us are open to one another, afford one another subjectivities based on mutual regard and recognition are interdependent and needy, relatively helpless to change things we care about, quite limited in our knowledge and understanding, but educatable, changeable in light of new circumstances, and routinely err. Beyond that, of course, the scale and scope of problems we collectively face are laughably beyond any individual's capacities to solve. Recognizing our involvement in and complicity with things we think are wrong, fully understanding the weight of wrongdoing in the history we inherit, or understanding the harms that have come from our failure to act can feel quite awful. The right uses purity politics against the left because we're the ones who respond to being implicated in doing harm. They're correct that we are involved in the very things that we want to stop, but they're wrong to think that being compromised means we should stop protesting or acting. If we stop working against them, terrible things simply continue. If we are to be effective, we who want to have a world 
in which many beings and ecosystems can flourish. We should reject purity for purely tactical reasons. It demobilizes us. But we should reject purity politics for deeper reasons too. Purity has long been the domain of the racist, nativist, and eugenicist right. It has been the technology through which laws about miscegenation were formulated, and it's still the emotional hinge on which today's alt-right argues that the white race is dying. Purity of the nation has been the rallying cry for tightening borders against the free movement of people. It is the engine that drives vigilante border patrols and murderous refugee policies. policies. Purity of the species has been the scalpel that forcibly sterilizes disabled people and that continues to support policy based on the idea that disabled lives are not worth living. At this point, I'm hoping that you and I share two views. First, that the situation of the world today is complex in such a way that simply existing as a person who eats food turns on heat or air conditioning, relies on infrastructure, pays taxes, and other very basic things implicates us in harms that we would prefer were not happening, such as global warming, the extinction crisis, or the indefinite detention of migrants in profoundly unjust condition. Second, I hope that we're sharing the view that the sense of complicity emerging from this sort of complexity is morally interesting, although unfortunately it is also currently configured in such a way that it forecloses action. So my central proposition is that complicity can produce solidarities oriented toward collective action. So I wanna underline that although we may not be able to individually solve something, we may still be considered morally responsible to try to solve it as best we can, which often is going to mean making collective social or systemic change. Another way to put this is to say that our implication in material complexity implies moral complicities unsolvable by individual will or action. If we want to respond to wicked problems like climate devastation, we need a relational ethical approach, an approach that holds relations as our smallest unit of analysis. This kind of ethics is always political in the sense that moral decisions in conditions of complicity depend on factors beyond the scope of the individual. Political decisions refer outside the individual to receive their normative weight. Such decisions, and I would argue complicity ethics generally, do not depend on innocence for their decision-making. Rather, they depend on the understanding that we confront hard problems problems that always leave what Bernard Williams thought of as a moral remainder, which can produce agent regret. As Lisa Tessman elucidates in her important work on burdened virtues and what she calls the ordinary vices of domination, these forms of moral trouble are common under oppression, arising as they do when averse conditions make, it, make even the very best possibility a morally problematic one or when bad luck leads one to engage in morally pro problematic ways, or even to develop a morally problematic character." End quote. So perhaps we can begin to truly confront moral trouble only once we give up on the idea of innocence and purity, only once we begin from complexity and complicity, only once we regard ethical collective decisions as inherently political. I believe we can be held responsible for a number of complicities that are beyond our personal control. Wrongs that we benefit from but cannot personally right, wrongs that we identify and could do something about but do not take action on because it's difficult or, or inconvenient, deaths and sufferings that did not need to happen or that did not need to be so awful, but that are produced by the social organization of oppression and benefit in our society, and most generally, um, something like how Ruth Wilson Gilmore articulates racism as the social organization of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. I think about that phrase all the time in relation to climate change. However, not every horrible thing that happens in the world is a site of complicity. Perhaps we should be understood as complicit 
only in horrible things that could be prevented and to which we are in some way connected. When someone dies on a landslide or avalanche, I may be sad for the people grieving their loss, but barring unusual responsibilities for avalanches, I am likely not to be complicit. When a miner dies at work in a cave-in beneath my city, which the mining company could have prevented with more investment in safety infrastructure, which they choose not to build because they calculated that the cost of life insurance for one miner's death per year was cheaper than infrastructure. And when my government provides that company with substantial tax write-offs to keep them in the country, I likely am complicit in that death. Of course, I'm less implicated than the person in the company who made the decision based on a profit loss ledger that weighs people's lives against insurance claims. Complicity is very much a matter of degree of connection, capacity to change the circumstances and the distribution of power. But the point here is that taking connection, complexity and complicity as a starting point for action rather than a reason to give up opens the possibilities for transformation for what I'm thinking of as ethical decision-making. So turning to the next section, this is on evil and the creativity of repair. And here I'm turning to an Arendtian approach to the question um, of the relationship between individuals and systems in assessing moral agency in relation to social complexity. Um, and then I'll turn to an account of forward-looking commitments to repair as a moral virtue. So Elizabeth Minich was a student of Hannah Arendt's and worked with her as a teaching assistant after the publication of Eichmann in Jerusalem. Um, and I'm referencing an article that um, is also a book, uh, part of a book on the evil of banality. And in this work, Minich distinguishes between intensive and extensive evils. She writes, intensive evils are horrific, episodic rather than sustained acts performed by individuals or small groups. The acts may stretch through time, but they do not infect many people. Typically, they are carried out in isolation, in secret, because they are precisely not normalized for a whole society or polity. Most people remain outside of, unimplicated in, acts of intensive evil. Extensive evils, in contrast, can become so woven into the fabric of lives, this is a quote, that individuals enact them with a sense that they are simply serving or protecting a good and necessary way of life, end quote. Extensive evil is woven into the fabric of our quote, ordinary normal lives. These are, as Minich puts it, quote, massively volatile harms kept up over time that simply, factually, could not be done by one or a few monstrous people. Such harms are accomplished by ordinary workers and enablers who cannot be understood simply as monsters enacting crimes of passion or prejudice. Minich argues, quote, there are still differing kinds and levels of complicity and guilt among the many doers and enablers of extensive evil, of course, but from enabling bystander to frontline agent of horrific harm, there is a web of mutual implication. Extensive evils require all of them to continue to show up and keep doing their work. So, end quote. It's not only a question of the numbers of people involved and as she puts it, genocides, slavery, colonialism, radically exploitative labor practice and other horrific harms, end quote, that calls on us to consider the moral weight of massively distributed wrongs. It is also a question of how evils like these become banal, ordinary, and accepted. So I continue in my life to rely on Claudia Card's expansive definition of evil, which is, uh, quote, reasonably foreseeable, intolerable harm produced by inexcusable wrongs. While Minich doesn't give an explicit definition of evil the way Card does, her examples give us a sense that extensive evil as a web of mutual implication produces ordinary complicities. Taking this sort of orientation, and I'm now moving this into an area that Minich does not treat, she doesn't talk about climate change. Complex harms such as climate catastrophe, 
widespread human caused extinctions, imprisoning refugees in camps or causing them to drown in the Mediterranean and violating indigenous land relationships to run dirty pipelines through vulnerable ecosystems would count as evils. Again, none of these problems can be solved by a single person's actions, no matter how little plastic they use or how rarely they fly. Individuals retain moral responsibility for our actions, of course, but we're also placed in relation to societal practices that contribute to the meaning we make of these actions. And yet, as Minich underlines, I'm sorry, I didn't have that slide. Um, so this is a, a longer quote, which I'll just read out. Quote, while it does not work to focus only on individuals as if we live, love, and have our being all on our own, it also does not work to give all agency over to systems, whether conceptual, moral, political, and or economic. We need to think through experiences as we find them in reality." End quote. So reflecting on our experiences as we find them in reality may allow us to perceive how our personal agency is bound up with, enabled by, or constrained by the agentic effects of the systems within which we exercise it. Sociologists think of this as exercising our sociological imagination, perceiving how our personal biography is simultaneously a social matter. We may want to extend this sort of imagination to developing a capacity to perceive how ecosystems and the changing interconnected living world exercises agency. So I'm understanding extensive evils such as colonialism, the extinction crisis, unjust treatment of migrants, ecological devastation, and so on, as sites of complicity with profound harm that invite repair, moral and practical. Elizabeth Spellman's book, Repair, The Impulse to Restore in a Fragile World, offers resources for this response to damage. She writes, to repair is to acknowledge and respond to the fracturability of the world in which we live in a very particular way, not simply by throwing our hands up in despair at the damage or otherwise accepting without question that there is no possibility of or point in trying to put the pieces back together, but by employing skills of mind, hand and heart to recapture an earlier moment in the history of an object or a relationship in order to allow it to keep existing." End quote. So in a moment, I will jettison, for reasons I believe are fully consonant with Spellman's own account, the restriction of repair to putting pieces back together or recapturing an earlier moment in the history of an object of repair, whether that's a thing in the world or a relationship. I find her approach generative in part for its understanding of repair as an action manifesting a response to damage and the despair it can engender. Repair enacts a commitment to not giving up. Spellman elaborates approaches to repair that include restoration, returning something to a previous state in such a way that one could not tell that it had undergone repair. But I'm most interested in bricolage, the using what is ready to hand as an approach to repair. It's through this approach that Spellman articulates a conception of creativity as central to repair. And in the longer version of this, I have uh, a lot of things from Eli Clare's work in his beautiful book, Brilliant Imperfection, about restoration as an approach to ecological transformation. So here I'm just sticking with Spellman. She begins with contrasting repair with destruction. She says, quote, Perhaps repair is more distinct from the destruction than it is from creation. After all, what intentional or unintentional destruction accomplishes is the end of something, its demise, its irreparability. If repair is about trying to preserve some kind of continuity with the past, keeping some aspect of it alive, destruction is about producing discontinuity with the past, trying to make sure the past is past, that it's over and done with. End quote. So again, I'm not convinced that we need the backward looking part of this conception of repair. Or maybe it would be better to say that in some cases, destroying relations of the past 
will be necessary to embark on a project of repair. The continuity with injustices of the past that continue to structure social relations of oppression will likely involve resisting what Gary Kinsman calls the social organization of forgetting. It will involve a continuity of memory, but it will also require important forms of discontinuity with the past. The inheritances of climate change include legacies of chattel slavery, colonialism, and racial capitalism. These histories produce differential current and future responsibilities. So Spellman turns to movements for restorative justice to think about how repair can grapple with political inheritances of complex harms. And it is here that I believe she should agree with my rejection of the idea of returning to a past state. Valuing flexible, situationally responsible approaches to damage she argues that we can think about repair as itself a form of destruction. As she puts it, repair is the creative destruction of brokenness. If we can understand extensive evils of the sort in which we are implicated as a pervasive state of brokenness, we might aim to destroy the state of brokenness we perceive. In this sense, Spellman argues that offering an apology can be a form of attempting to destroy a state of rupture between people. Thinking about repair as a way of becoming more engaged or connected with a state of brokenness may open space for creative collaborative approaches to complicity. And here my thinking is really guided by Alice McLaughlin's work on forgiveness and public and political apology. Again, in the longer version of this. What's important here is that we can destroy brokenness even there, if there is no state of wholeness to which we can return. Indeed, the creative destruction of brokenness may be a better way to think about our response to extensive evil. Such evils affect so many people in so many ways, producing moral damage and weakening our sense of moral agency. The capacity to respond well may require practices of creation we cannot yet predict. In the final section now, I wanna to turn to sketching modes of the creative destruction of brokenness that I think might help us in the project of crafting non-teleologically bound futures. So just to underline this, one reason for rejecting a conception of repair that depends on previous states is to retain the possibility that we could repair relations that have never not been broken, relations that need to be destroyed before any other ethical engagement can begin. I'm also worried about arguments based on a return to prior states because they may commit us to the kind of purity politics that I discuss above, the idea that only if we're innocent in relevant ways can we take action, um, which is impossible and demobilizing in my view. So section three, collective responses. Um, and coming back, as I always do, to the problem of individualism. Purity discourse depends entirely on a lie. And that lie is the idea that there's any way to be alive without being connected. Charges of complicity can be read as simple statements about being relationally shaped. Frequently, of course, relationally shaped in connection with social relations and effects that we reject or abjure. But when we begin from relationality, understanding our complicities is not a ground for despair or shutting down. Complicities instead are anchors, points of attachment and connection that give us traction for movement. It is not because I'm innocent of participating in climate catastrophe that I have standing to oppose it. It can be precisely because I am implicated that I oppose it. For surely if innocence and purity are requirements for political action, none of us are qualified to do anything. We do better to aim for an ethics and politics of imperfection. If we do not fit the mold of perfection, if we're disabled, sick, young, old, not working, not productive, we are definitely beings who can offer care, help, solidarity, and presence to the world. If we've failed to help in the past, if things we do are implicated in harm, if we benefit from something that harms others, or if we accord only some people access to a podium, we can still be of benefit to this world. Even people who have harmed others or the world, whose ancestors owned slaves, 
whose current government is actively pursuing, pursuing genocidal colonial policies, who regularly make mistakes, even we can be useful. But how to unfurl a practice that holds our imperfections? Ethically, I believe a model of the creative repair of brokenness can take us a long ways. But insofar as that ethics requires a politics, I suggest taking up a politics of responsibility, which is a concept I take from social movement scholar Gary Kinsman. He defines a politics of responsibility as involving, quote, those of us in oppressing positions, recognizing our own implication within and responsibility to challenge relations of oppression, end quote. Politics of responsibility recognizes our relative, shifting, and contingent positions in social relations of harm and benefit. It enjoins us to look at how we are shaped by our place in that history. We can take responsibility for creating futures that radically diverge, seriously engaging that work based on where we are located, listening well to the people, beings, and ecosystems most vulnerable to devastation. So the question then is not, how will I be innocent of implication in complex and distributive harms? The question becomes, what forms of implication will we take up as points of connection for anchoring our activities? With whom will we become complicit? Whose side are we on? Recognizing complicity can be a way to respond to the extensive evils in which we are implicated. That implication involves being placed in a we that likely we did not choose or that we want to oppose. Practicing placing ourselves in different alliances places us in a collective we that resists those evils. We are still implicated, but that implication itself is the ground for our opposition. The way to oppose purity politics, individualism, and immobilization turns out also to be a way to respond to our implication and extensive evils. And that solution is going to be collective social movements. So asking which side we are on raises the prospect of binary purist thinking about politics as though it was easy to delimit sides and as though complicity would make it impossible for us to be on the side of justice. If we're complicit no matter what we do, and if we cannot excuse ourselves from implication, we can take that situation as the ground for action. So the slide here has an image of a beehive with the world words, all we have is each other, mutual aid, and an image from some of the Fridays for the Future climate strikes by youth in Belgium uh, in 2019. Uh, and I, one of the signs, many, many signs in this image says, what I stand for is what I stand on, um, which I think is one example of knowing where you stand to some extent and then standing there, right? So, I think that precisely the political features of ethical decision-making in complex and relational contexts make this explicit, especially ethically interesting terrain. So the good news when there are not easy answers is that we have the capacities to elaborate the stakes and reasons for our decisions. We have the capacities to make strategic decisions and to know when we are effectively fighting evil and pursuing repair. Learning how to constitute ourselves as part of a collective project where we take care of each other, where we act in solidarity with the living and dead whose lives are shaped by ongoing extensive evil is not easy. Indeed, in the past 50 years of neoliberalism and descendant individualism, um, th like these things have achieved a significant de-skilling of ordinary people's capacities for collective work. Many people today have never been in any collective formation that is not hierarchical, or more or less invested in the existing social order. Very few of us have been part of collective projects to transform the world that have won any gains at all. We're very much on our back foot. It makes sense that even imagining repair and restoration for ongoing harms that benefit us is difficult. It makes sense that people feel alone and that we despair. I've learned the most about how to approach addressing this in trainings and activist strategy, and I, I wanna draw here on this model of what gets called the spectrum of allies approach. So the image here is a um, complicated diagram uh, where in the middle is a kind of rainbow and on one side are, is written leading activists 
and directly opposed to that, you know, sort of 180 degrees opposed is leading opponents. And then in each um, quadrant, moving from right to left, you see a kind of um, moving from leading opponents to active opponents, to passive opponents, to oblivious neutrals right in the middle, passive allies, active allies, and then people who are activists. So this spectrum approach names a really common tendency in activism, which is to direct our attention and work toward the people we most directly oppose, the people most directly responsible for the harm we've identified as the problem at hand. So thinking about the example in my country of Canada's ongoing invasion of Wet'suwet'en land in service of Petro Futures to lay a um, pipeline across their, their area of responsibility. If I'm standing with Wet'suwet'en people and against climate change, I might try to address my moral and political work to the British Columbia provincial government or to the chief of the Royal Canadian Mountain Police or to the prime minister of Canada. And it's true that all of those people in various ways have decision-making power to make different decisions about the things in which we're mutually implicated. They are more responsible and more complicit. But a key shift in the spectrum of allies approach is to stop addressing oneself primarily to people who directly or ideologically oppose us with the idea that they're gonna reverse their position through moral suasion. Taking this spectrum approach, we're aiming instead to move people from where they are, wherever they are, to one or two positions over toward us. So to move people who are passive allies who think, I don't think we should have more pipelines. That doesn't make sense. Why did the government buy a pipeline? Um, to being like, oh, I actually wanna do something about that and I see what I could do. Or we want people who are passive opponents who are like, yeah, probably a pipeline's a good idea to become like oblivious neutrals, to be like, I don't know, like I no longer am sure about that. So crucially, this kind of approach assumes that we're all connected, that no one is essentially or fundamentally pure or evil, that anyone can change their minds through changing their activities. Um, this approach is grounded in nonviolent communication and it presupposes listening to opponents, actually listening, and this is one of the things I find challenging about it, listening to people directly across from us on an issue. So listening to people different th than us, and especially listening to people we consider complicit in evil is a little bit unpopular right now, um, but I think it's an ethically and politically interesting proposition. But the kind of listening we're interested in here remains political in the sense that it is committed to certain worlds and not others. So again, as we are complicit, we can act in solidarity and stand with some people and not others. As Katrina Shields puts it in the book, In the Tiger's Mouth, which is a like, activist strategy and tactics guide, uh, she frames this as kind of uncompromising listening. Quote, although listening to the op opposition's point of view is important, it is equally important to put your position and be heard, both by the opposition and by the public. This can be quite an anxiety provoking experience when you are not used to doing it. Something I have found useful is imagining those I represent standing behind me, whether they be environments, creatures, or humans, including those of the future. They require me to not betray them by giving up my power in these situations. This has been a source of strength, enabling me to speak up and not compromise. So I think of this approach as a kind of brave relation of building the capacity to stand in relation to situations and evils with which we would like to cut off relation. And the point of that spectrum of allies approach is that when you're listening in this way, you're doing it so that you're building power to have millions and millions of people which is what we require to fundamentally transform these systems, working together so that you actually are a threat to the people that you currently oppose. Because moral suasion does not cause them to change their behavior, power causes them to change their behavior. So when we're taking a spectrum of allies approach, what we're trying to build is collective power. That's why we would do it. So listening well, taking responsibility, practicing mutual aid and acting even though we recognize that we can't be pure, it's going to be much harder than disengaging would be. I think often about this poem by Danny Brick called If You Could Go Back, um, which calls us into a politics of responsibility in this mode. 
This is just a, a part of the poem, but I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, it begins, I know, I know. If you could go back, you would walk with Jesus. You would march with King, maybe assassinate Hitler, at least hide Jews in your basement. It would all be clear to you. The people then, just like you, were baffled, had bills to pay and children they didn't understand. And they too were so desperate for normalcy. They made anything normal, even turning everything inside out, even killing and killing. And it's easy for turning the other cheek to be looking the other way, for walking to be talking. And they hid in their houses and watched it on television when they had television or wrung their hands or didn't. And your hands are just like theirs, lined, permeable, and small. And he ends the poem by saying, that's King. And this is Salma and Berlin and Jerusalem. And now is when they need you to be brave. I always regret putting this poem anywhere that I'm speaking publicly. I'm not capable of reading it and not crying. So I always make a note for my future self. Don't do that again. And then I fail. So what I take from this poem is the idea that in responding to these kind of extensive evils in which we are implicated, we can um, practice this kind of solidarity and these kinds of mutual aids, which means we can say that, um, let us be imperfect for we are, but let us be brave too. Thanks so much, that's it.